Hey, Ballard Church, I'm so glad you jumped in with us again this Sunday, or really whatever day you found time to jump into church. I'm so glad you decided to carve out a little time to figure out how God wants to move in your life and how he's moving through this church. Last week, if you missed it, it was kind of the opening sequence to this message. Now, this one will stand on its own legs, but if you got time, pause it. Jump to, the, jump to the other one, then jump to this one. And if you did catch us last week, uh, man, you kind of got left on a cliffhanger. It was one of those moments like when season one ends and you're like, wait, what hap- well, what's happening next? Then you got to wait a little while for the next one. The good news is season two came out just seven days later. So here we are. Uh, we're, in the, we're continuing our misquoted series, and as we talk through maybe some misconceptions, some misquotes, some misunderstandings we have about the Bible and what Jesus taught, and, and bigger than that even, how God interacts in our lives. Because we know this to be true, our view of God, our understanding of God, our knowledge of God really dictates how we expect Him to interact with us in our lives. It manages our expectations, and if we're not careful, it really does mismanage our expectations as well. Last week, we started the conversation, such an uplifting conversation, around the topic of depression. Depression. We went through some staggering stats to see just how big the the swath, or really the scope of depression has gotten in our country and in our community. It is impacting people everywhere. And if you're really honest, after a difficult year like 2020, you've probably felt glimpses and moments of it as well. For some of you, maybe it was something that categorized your 2020. If you're really, really honest, you would know you struggled with the depression, with uh, difficult thoughts, with uh, mood variations, with maybe even some some thoughts of self-harm. In fact, one of the stats we went through last week is uh, one quarter of young adults in America admitted the fact that they had suicidal thoughts during 2020. 25% of young adults. It's, it's becoming an epidemic, and it's unbelievable. And the good news is that the Bible talks about it. Now, the bad news is because mental health issues are shrouded in so much stigma and misunderstanding, that not only in our day-to-day lives and in our culture is it misunderstood, but really in a faith perspective as well, it's misunderstood. And, and unfortunately, I hear so many things like, you know, if you're feeling depressed, just start praying more and it'll all go away. Or, and how could you feel depressed if you knew how much God loved you? And, and those might be helpful statements in the moment, but sometimes they can be really dismissive of the things that God is doing and working through depression. Last week, we talked about some of the things really using the story of Elijah. Um, We got halfway through the story. We're going to finish the story today, but we talked about some of the things that get us into these almost caves of depression, which is where uh, Elijah finds himself is in in a physical cave. But Man, doesn't it feel like when you when you enter a season of depression, no matter how long it is, that it can feel like a cave? It's dark. It's disorienting. You know there's a way out, but you don't really know how to get there. There's bats and creepy collies. Even if you try and feel around, you just you feel lost in it. It feels hopeless, and it feels helpless. The good news that we have today, and this is really what I want to talk about for the remainder of the time that we have tracing through Elijah's story, is that uh, we have options. We have options. Now, I made the same preface last week that there are, there are literal biological issues that come into play when it comes to dealing with depression. I am not going to minimize those or dismiss those. I am a big fan of seeking a doctor's help and advice, of, of medication where it's needed. I'm definitely a fan of going to sit with somebody in counseling or therapy to help work through and get some guidance uh, when you're facing depression. So I don't want to minimize that or work past that, but I also don't believe that it's the entire story. Nowhere in our life do we allow uh, just the biology to be the entire teller of the story, that, that there's so much more at play. And what depression would want to trick you into thinking is that you're hopeless and helpless that you no longer have any options. It has been taken out of your control, and you are just along for the ride, that you can't do anything about it, you can't change it, this is who you are, and it is is now your identity, which I don't think the Bible teaches, and honestly, research wouldn't even show us, is true. Even from a secular perspective outside of the Bible, research would tell us that the ball is still in your court, and we have so many different options at play. So, Each one of the things that we're going to work through today are steps we can take to start getting out of the cave 
of depression. So maybe you need to take some notes today. Maybe you need to send this message to somebody. Or maybe you just need to get a pen and paper ready to go. Heck, maybe you're watching on a computer. You can just type it down too. Um, but you can maybe track along with the story of Elijah as we continue on last week. If you remember last week, uh, Elijah had just come off the heels of multiple victories in God's name. I mean, he was, he was just crushing everything. He was successful. He was doing a fantastic job. He was teaching about God. God was showing up in miraculous ways on his behalf. It was just like awesome. And he got one message, the equivalent today of one text for you. Maybe it was one comment or post on Instagram or Facebook. That somebody just fired back and you just it let it get to him. And, and Elijah, after all of these victories and God showing up in huge ways, finds himself in a crushing depression over one comment. And here's how he begins to step himself out. and Rather, what God chooses to do in the midst of it. Ready? We're going to be in 1 Kings. We're going to continue in our story in 1 Kings chapter 19. Here we go. This is going to be good. Then he, this is Elijah, lay down under the bush and fell asleep. Man, is not that feel good? That nap sounds good right now. We'll take it. Uh, all at once an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and he laid down again. I mean, this is amazing. I mean, talk about my dream day. You're outside. It's a beautiful day in Seattle. It's 72 degrees. You fall asleep underneath the tree somewhere. It's just unbelievably nice. Somebody wakes you up with food wafting in your face and some nice cool water. You drink, you eat, and then you fall right back asleep. Two naps in a day. This is incredible. Here's how it continues. The angel of the Lord came back a second time, touched him, said, get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and he ate and he drank, strengthened by that food. He traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. This is Mount Carmel. Maybe you've heard of this uh, before, but before he even took his journey, this is amazing. He ate, he drank, and he slept. Oh, man. The first thing that I think we can do to step ourselves into a place of healing, step ourselves out of the cave of depression, is this, is you need to, uh, you need to step into a needed recovery. You need to step into a needed recovery. Get this. He was fueled. He was strengthened by the fact that he ate, drank, and took a nap. How amazing is this? Church, your homework to draw closer to God today is to take a nap. You have biblical permission to go to sleep in the middle of the afternoon. Don't even set an alarm. Don't even worry about it. Have somebody else watch your kids. I don't even know. You figure it out. But you have the opportunity and permission to go eat incredible food. This is God's permission to go to Canlis, get a great meal, and go home and take a nap. This is the Lord's will. And if you're here and you're vegan, you need to go to shelter. They got all vegan menu. You figure it out, get some delicious food, and go home and take a nap. This is the thing that God is calling us to do. And it, and it might seem strange. It might seem silly. But isn't it true when we disorder our pace of life, when we get frantic and, and crazy, we don't take time to get the foundational needed recovery? That really we're asking God for healing, we're asking God for help, but we're continued with the frantic pace of life. Last week we talked about this some as well, but before we can move into the things that God really has for us, before we move into the healing, as you see with Elijah, before God even shows up, before he calls him to do anything, before he challenges him, before he encourages him, before he does anything, he has him sleep and eat and meet the basic needs of his life. If you're really honest, you can take an inventory. I, I can. I don't know your life, but be honest with yourself. Are you really taking care of yourself in like just even the normal physiological way? Are you getting enough sleep? When, are, are you getting a full night? Are you taking your rest? Are you eating some food? Are you nourishing yourself in a way that's healthy? Are you, are you uh, moving forward with the basic things that God um, really has in line for you. And I think the easiest way to do this is to really negotiate our schedules, to figure out what our schedule has to say. Here's what we see in the Bible. It teaches the same exact thing. Teach us to number our days. This is a psalm. This is asking God, teach me to number my days and recognize how few they are. Help us, don't say us, me, help me to spend them as I should. Help me recognize what days are valuable. Help me recognize that maybe the most fruitful thing I can do for my life is to organize it, is to make margin for a nap. Because you know the season where you feel healthiest in your life is the season when you have margin 
And I realize that is a challenging word nowadays, and you're thinking, how idealistic are you? You don't have the life that I have. You don't have the schedule. You don't have the demands. You're right. I I don't have the same life as you, but I promise you, you can find a margin in it. And if you can't, maybe it's a time to reprioritize because you can show up as a weakened version of yourself to susceptible to some of the hardest things in our life, or you can make the tough choices to find some margin. That's right. I'm telling you to go to your boss and say, hey, my pastor told me that I can't respond to your email at midnight. I can't do it. I can't reply anymore. When you email me at 2 a.m. and you expect me to be up and jump and jump through that hoop and make your phone call, I'm sorry, my pastor told me to leave my phone in the kitchen. And so I couldn't, I couldn't be ready at your beck and call at midnight. And if that's frustrating to you, figure out some boundaries. You can hand him a book by Dr. Henry Cloud called Boundaries. You might get yourself fired. But you know what? Hey, it might be for the best. Anyway, because we know, we know this, come on, we know this to be true, that sometimes we need to find the foundational piece, before God even moves in a significant way, the foundational piece to be able to restore from there. That's your homework. That's your homework. That's a tangible first step that you can take. Let's continue in our story with Elijah and see how this goes. This is so good. There, he went into a cave. So he's still depressed. He's just hungry now. He's fed. He's ready for God to move in his life. But that doesn't mean everything went away. You're not just going to eat and wake up from your nap. I mean, I hope you do and you wake up feeling better. But, but still, there's some work to be done. There's still some moves to make. So he's in his cave and he spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? Come on, I've called you. Come on, we've done all these things. We're moving and shaking. What, what are you doing? It's like when, you, it's like when you're on vacation and you finally take your kids to Disneyland, and you're in the hotel, and it's the morning of, you're going to wake up from Disneyland, and your kids come and wake you up, and they said, there's work to be done. What are you doing here? What are you doing in bed? Why are, we at, why are we at Disneyland? Let's do this. Come on, there's something significant happening. So God presses Elijah, says, what are you doing here? And this is Elijah's response. This is so good. He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant. They've torn down your altars. They've put your prophets to death with the sword at... If that's not bad enough, he's feeling so bad about himself, he's rehearsed this line. This is the thing that rolls through his head of why he should feel bad and why he deserves to feel bad. And and all these things might be true, but it's the things that just continue to play. And I'm the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. Like everything's going wrong and and the, the culture's turning against you, God, and nobody's listening anymore. And I was the only one who was zealous and they've put everyone else to death and and now they're trying to kill me too. Now there's nothing left that, that can be hopeful. There's nothing else that can be helpful. And so the next thing, now that, now that he's prepared to receive, he's still depressed, he's still frustrated, he prepares him for the second thing. You ready for the second thing? The second thing is this, that we can do as we try and, uh, as we try and continue. Actually, you know what? Let's see what God says in reply verse. Sorry, here we go. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord. This is so good. For the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. I mean, this is, this is amazing. You guys, you need, to, you need to catch this. He goes out, and the fireworks start, people. I mean, this is like big, heavy stuff. Mountains start getting torn apart in front of him. But the Lord was, he wasn't in the wind. Next, this is incredible. After the wind, there was an earthquake. Maybe he's trying to shake him up to get Elijah's attention. As earthquake starts, mountains are getting torn apart, but... The Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire. This is crazy. This, after the earthquake came a fire. And the Lord, the, he wasn't in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. Isn't that amazing? That after all these big bangs and fireworks, that, that finally God shows up in a whisper. And I think what happens when we, when we prepare ourselves well is now the second thing that I think we see that Elijah did is he stepped into an encounter with God. He stepped into a God encounter. And listen, I'm like you. I wanted to be the earth shaking, the wind moving through, the fire everywhere, earth, wind, and fire, anybody? Now you know where they got that from, right? And some of you don't know what I'm talking about, but that's okay. It's, it's a different story. You can ask your parents. But you step into what God is thinking, and you, you expect it to be these big, grandeur things. But instead, God spoke to Elijah in a whisper. And sometimes in the midst of our darkest moments, we want God to show up in a significant way. And that's not a bad thing. You're not selfish for that. You're not greedy or insensitive. But I just want to set your expectations right that he may not. 
It may not look like he shows up in your room in front of you and picks you up and, and carries you out the room and feeds you. Himself. It, it may not look like that, but, but we might be prepared for something else because this is the truth and this is what happens. We look for the dynamic, but God is in the intimate. We look for the fireworks. We look for the earthquake, the mountains shaking. We look for these big signs. We ask God, like, okay, God, if you do this, if you pull off this around me, then I'll start working through my depression. God, if, if you do this, if you move in their heart, if they send me an apology, if they figure this out, then finally I'm going to begin to take steps of my own. But God invites us to the intimate. He invites us to a whisper. He invites us to tune in to what he would want to speak. And that's why I think the first step is so crucial because it sets the platform, it sets the stage for you to be able to listen to God, well-rested and fed, that, that the other superficial needs are met. So the fact that you can actually zone in to what God would want to speak to you, the fact that God does eagerly look to speak to you, but, but sometimes we miss it. Maybe this is a challenge for you. Maybe this is something that's less of a thing that you see on a bumper sticker, but more something you can take to heart. It says this in the Psalms, be still and know that I am God. Be still. Stop moving. At the end of our services, I always ask people to do this. I explain it the same way every time, and it comes from this philosophy, is, is simply the idea that in our rushed life, we're rarely still. We never, rarely take a moment to just exhale and see what God wants to do. We're worried about the next thing. What are we having for lunch? Where are we moving from here? What are my kids doing? What am I going to do the rest of the day? What am I going to do this week? When's my next vacation? We're too worried about those things, and, and those aren't bad things, but sometimes God wants to speak to you in a still, small voice. So at the end of our services, I always tell people to like set stuff down and bow your head and close your eyes because there's nothing really spiritual, but I think what it does is it just closes our eyes so we can't get distracted, and we bow our heads so even if we cheat and we open them, that we're just looking at the ground. That's it. That's the super secret spiritual recipe of why I have people do that. Is I think it just helps us find that still small moment in the midst of a really busy life. Uh, David, who was this famous king, he wrote a lot of the Psalms. He had this uh, worship leader. He's like our Taylor and Caroline. And uh, he had this guy named uh, Asaph, and he's really depressed in this whole Psalm, Psalm 73. He's, he's really depressed. He's talking about how wicked the world is the whole time. And then finally he gets to the end of it, and he says this, when I tried to understand all this, it troubled me deeply till I entered the sanctuary of God. When I tried to make sense of the world, when I tried to understand, when I tried to solve the world's problems, when I turned on the news and everything seemed like it was on fire and everything's going to mess and some person's mad at somebody else and I wish I could do something about it and somehow I get mad or bitter and I can't believe they think that and all these things came up inside of me and I couldn't understand it. I was deeply troubled until I entered the sanctuary of God. And all that stuff seemed to get a lot smaller. It was still important still consequences, still the world we live in. But for a moment, I got a glimpse of the peace and the rest that God offers. And when I do that, when I slow down and I seek an encounter with Him, I'm telling you, I am a big fan of so many things, but there is nothing that can replace an encounter with Jesus. There's nothing that can replace an interaction with God, a moment in His Word, a moment where He speaks revelation, a moment of His comfort is better than anything that could show up in this world. I, I believe that to be true, and I believe that's our greatest resource. And so in the midst of this, in the midst of earthquakes and fires and mountains getting torn apart and God speaking to Elijah directly, he still finds himself in the cave. And this is what we see he does next. So, so, so next he does this. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. It's interesting that he, that he took the cloak and put it over his face because his face for even then and now is the only thing we can use to identify people, right? It's their face. Somebody might have the same structure as you physically, but their face is an identifier that's so unique and so specific to you. And so he hid his face in order to hide his identity, in order to hide who he was. And he stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, this sound familiar? What are you doing here, Elijah? Come on, this is God again, the same rehearsed thing. Come on, I spoke to you. Are you still here? Are you ready to take a next step? Are you ready to move forward? And this is Elijah's response. This is so good. This is going to sound a little familiar. 
He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God. I said the same thing. The same thing he rehearsed before. The Israelites have rejected your covenant. They've torn down your altars. They've put your prophets to death with a sword. And I am the only one left. And now there's, they're trying to kill me too. <clears throat> they're trying to kill me too. And, and he covers up his face, I believe, to cover up his true identity. To try and cover up the call of God on his life. Because he knows there's something inside of him that knows where he should be. <clears throat> there's something inside of him that knows that God showed up before. He showed up for others, and he, sh- he even showed up in his own life. And in those moments, he feels so ashamed, and he feels so lost. And God asks again, what are you doing? And he has the same rehearsed line because he's like, you don't understand. Isn't that funny how oftentimes, I know I'm guilty of it, maybe you're not, but you say to God, well, God, you just don't understand. You don't understand anymore. <clears throat> the third step I think God invites us to is this, is to step into a true identity. To not cover up your face, to not be ashamed, to not move and shake and get something weird and, and try something else. And, and you know, I think it's easy. I, I read this and I, I start making fun of Elijah a little bit. You know that? I start making fun of him and I go like, man, if he only knew, like if he knew, like if I knew God was speaking to me, like wouldn't I change my response? I mean, if God showed up in the significant way and audibly spoke to, I wouldn't cover up my face and be like, God, you're so good. And I like to play out the story like I would respond differently. But if we're really honest, I think I can respond in the same way. Can I be really transparent with you? Uh, through this last year, there's, I think there's been ups and downs for me the same way as there have been for anybody else. And last summer uh, was a little bit challenging for me. It was a little bit challenging because the, the pandemic had started to take place. We, we, my wife and I came to Ballard Church um, you know, over two years now. And we had this great season where, you know, God felt like he was really moving. It was incredible. People are getting saved. People are getting baptized. We're seeing God move. People are getting in a community, finding healing. It's just like everything you'd want it to be. And it's hard work, but it's a ton of fun. And we got to do it with the people that we love. And it's incredible. And the pandemic kind of shuts us down. And everything is difficult. We transition to online. And it feels a little bit different because I'm speaking to a camera. And I'm like, ah, this is kind of clunky. But even in the midst of it, God shows up in significant ways, and we hear incredible ways that God is moving through our online campus. Like people like you are sharing this with people all over the world, and it's just like cool to see what God is doing, the decisions that are being made over, and he's just surprising the heck out of us. But last summer, I just remember being disheartened. I was like, hey, this is only going to last a little bit, but now it feels like this is going to last forever, and we were trying so hard, and when are we going to come back? And these doubts started to come through my mind. And I'm thinking to myself, like, what am I even doing? Like, God, do you have somebody else to pass this church? Like, why is this, why is this going on? And I started throwing myself a little pity party for one. Had my little, own little tiny sad confetti cannons. And I was just so sad about it and disappointed and disheartened. And, and I think about Elijah, what he said. <laughs> and if I'm honest— uh, I, think, I think I would have said it a little bit different. And today is the very first day we're going we're gonna to actually release the Lance translation of the Bible. This is my own translation of that verse, if I'm just really honest with myself. It says this, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. I've been preaching good messages to show people you. The government and Dr. Fauci won't let me fill up our auditorium and culture's going to hell. And I'm the only one left and Instagram's trying to kill me too. Like everything's going wrong. Why everything just feels like too much and I get one bad comment on something and I get one bad thing and I'm like, ah, I just started spiraling and all of a sudden when I put it in this context, I know I'm just trying to be silly for a moment, but when I put it in that context, I start to think to myself, maybe Elijah is human after all. Maybe this hero of faith is human just like you and me and maybe, just maybe, if God can meet a hero of faith with patience and grace, Maybe he wants to meet me in the same way. But maybe he wants to do the same thing he wants to do with Elijah and remind him of his true identity, remind him of his calling. Eleanor Roosevelt has this absolutely incredible quote I thought was so powerful. No one can make you feel inferior without your consent. No one can make you feel inferior without your consent. Social media can't do that. No one around you can do that. No one, without your consent, unless you consent yourself to feel inferior, you won't let yourself do it. So you have control. You are in the driver's seat. You can take next steps. This is much a reminder for, for you as it is for me. These are things that I need to remind myself often. Uh, and God, this is interesting, God doesn't, 
when he replies to Elijah in this next verse, he, he doesn't even uh, really affirm his complaint. He doesn't even validate it. He just kind of moves forward and starts giving him homework. This, this is amazing. The Lord said to him, he didn't say like, oh, quit throwing a pity party, brush yourself off. He didn't say, you're right, this is hard for you, this is difficult. He just said, go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. Come on out of the cave. It's time to step out. And this, this, is, this may not feel like anything to you. This may feel very passive. This may feel uh, quick. It may be something you read over quickly, but this is why I love getting to do what I get to do. Remember, you'll have to look back to last week, but on the way in, he passed through Beersheba. And that was the way that God was calling him back out. And Beersheba, get this, is exactly where people were called and anointed into the service of God. So Elijah, years and years and years before, would have passed through Beersheba. And that's where he would have made a commitment to say, God, you are going to be the number one in my life. I'm going to follow you with everything. My life is yours. You have it all. And in the moment of depression, God invites him back to that space, back to the place where he originally committed, back to the place of humility, of followership. And believe it or not, that's the same thing that Jesus invites us to. Jesus never invited us to believe in him because that would have been uh, a pretty weird thing to declare to the people who were standing there with him. Like, hey, believe in me. They're like, okay, check. You're right here. I believe in you. That's great. More than that, he said, follow me. Follow me with your life. Give your life to me and see what happens. And I think that's what God invites Elijah back to in the same way that he would invite you and I back to that commitment as well. Because in the place where he discovered his identity is the place that he would find the assignment once more. And when we step out of the cave, when we start to realize that we need to find health and taking a step back and rediscovering some things and finding God's presence in the midst of it, when all of that takes place, we need to do this. We need to step into a new assignment. We need to step into a new assignment. We need to remember, and this is exactly what Elijah did. He stepped into the new assignment that God had for him. It's amazing. God actually walked him back to Beersheba and from there challenged him to go anoint leaders and call people out. And the moment that Elijah felt alone, remember he said, I'm the only one left. There's no one else like me. God continued to point out person after person after person after person who would be on his side and, and an ally to him in this next season. And that was his job, to call up other people in the midst of it. But when we lose sight of what our assignment is, what our call is, what our purpose is, what our identity truly is, it's so easy to feel like you've lost track. It's so easy to feel visionless. In fact, Proverbs says this. I think this is so poignant in Proverbs 29. uh, Where there is no vision, the people perish. Same thing goes for your life. In those moments of depression, I think the enemy tries to rob us of vision that today is simply going to be another day to despair, that I don't know why I would try and make it through. My life's not really going to add up to much. And he, he, would, he would try and get you to forget how valuable you are, what an asset you are to the people around you, the gifts that you possess. There's a, an incredible psychologist, his name was Viktor Frankl. And coming out of uh, World War II, he worked with tons of people who were, who were in Holocaust camps, uh, tons of Jewish people, and it was It was amazing to see his work, and and he created this thing called logotherapy as a result of it, and it it was pillared on a a bunch of different things, but one of them is without purpose, people wouldn't find meaning. And in fact, the people that he said would make it to the other side psychologically and physically, um, that would would face the least impact from the horrific things that they experienced, is the people who reestablished purpose and meaning. This is one quote from him that I think is so powerful. It says, people have enough to live but nothing to live for. They have the means, but no meaning. If you could really, I mean, I hate to say it, and I think I'm grouped into this too, but if you could categorize our generation, if you could categorize maybe America right now, I mean, come on, we have enough to live by. We're making it it work in, in the scope of history and really in the scope of the world, we're doing all right, but we have nothing to live for. We have the means, but not necessarily the vision. And they have the means, but they have no meaning. There's no meaning behind it. And he says when this happens, when this recipe takes place, it's when people lead themselves into a cave. It's when they lead themselves in this perpetual cycle of I have no meaning, thus I accomplish no meaning, thus I have no meaning. 
Thus I accomplish no meaning. Thus I have no meaning. And, and so they, they continue to move forward and move forward. And maybe that's a loop that's played in your mind before. Maybe that's a loop that's played in your mind. And today, I just want to tell you from the Word of God in Jesus' name that you have a meaning, that you have a purpose, that you have a means to live by. And simply getting through to pay the bills for another week is not your call. That is not the goal that Jesus has for your life, that he has something even greater, that he has something to, that he's calling you to step into. And we try to provide as many opportunities as we can here on the church for people to discover their purpose, but, but really, I know there's so many out there in general. Maybe it's just having a conversation with your neighbor to encourage somebody else to stand in the gap for somebody, to be a mentor for the next generation, to serve in a kid's ministry. I don't know what it is for you, but I believe that God has something greater for your life. So do not forget that you have meaning. Do not forget that God set you up to do something absolutely incredible. And uh, this is the last one. This is the last one because without this, I think we start to to lose wheels here. I think this is a practical step that each one of us can take as we close out here. I think this can can change it um, for all of us. Actually, there's a verse in Corinthians I want you to read first. This This is a verse I think is so good. Therefore, we do not lose heart, Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. It continues on, and it says this, For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us the eternal glory that far outweigh them all. So we fix our eyes, not on what is seen, because that's easy. Anyone can do that. And every, this is natural. Fixing your eyes on what's seen, that's natural. Anybody can do that. It takes no faith to do that. It takes no trust in Jesus. You don't have to follow Jesus to fix your eyes on what is seen. But we do on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen, ooh, now that's special. That is significant. That's the kingdom of God. And that is eternal. That's awesome. I hope that's encouraging to you as we step into our fifth one. This is the fifth step that you can take. This is our final one. This is, this is where I'm going to wrap up and I can close because I believe we step into relational strength. We have to step into a community that supports us and encourages us. At the end of the day, at the very end of the story, I don't know the verse up here, but I'll just tell it to you. At the very end of the story, Elijah begins to walk himself out of this cave and he begins to anoint other people. Finally, he comes to one of the people he's called to anoint who's working and toiling in the field. He probably feels just as discouraged as Elijah did. And what he does, he takes off his cloak and he throws it over him in encouragement and to anoint him. And it's, it's this incredible picture, I think, of what the church can do for each other now. Not just out of our own strength and because we pulled up our bootstraps and we figured it all out and we did our thing, but we did the diligent work and we trusted God in the midst of it. We trusted God to show up in a way that he promised that he would and out of the strength that he provides us, we step out into something significant. There's a leadership coach and consultant who who has this quote. This is where we're going to end up here. It says, look carefully at the closest associations in your life for that is the direction you are headed. And if you were honest with yourself and you think, you know, I don't really have a lot of associations in my life, then no wonder you may not feel like you're going anywhere. But I promise you there's something so significant when people start to interact with people in an intentional way. More than just I double tapped and liked your post. More than just like way to go, I'm caught up on on the things that are happening in your life from a distance. But in a way that even if it's socially distanced, you're calling somebody. You're invested in their life. You're taking the time. You're, you're really asking the difficult questions. If the statistics are real, then the assumption can be made that there are definitely people in our church, and more importantly, definitely people in your sphere of influence who are suffering from depression, who, who silently are holding it together because they're afraid. If I, if I talked to anyone about it or owned up to it, that people would think of me differently. They'd think less of me. They would just see me as the depressed person. We wouldn't be able to have conversations. But come on, let's, let's, let's break the misconceptions. This is not define who you are. It is an opportunity to step in. And oftentimes, depression is a warning sign to something even bigger. It's a warning sign that we have our life out of balance. The things need to change, and some things need to be renegotiated, and our schedule needs to move. We need to find balance once again. We need to be restored. We need to take a nap and get something to eat. Come on, you need to take a moment to figure out what God's trying to teach you and speak to you. And I think at the end of the day, when we do that together, is when we find strength. It's amazing that the Bible continues to teach this balance between individuals. That though we go to God with so much, 
we're also invited to go to each other. And God didn't have to do that. He could have just said, hey, just come to me with everything and ignore the folks around you. Just kind of live mutually amongst each other and try not to to let your dog take a number two on your neighbor's yard. That'll be like a good thing to do. Like, there's just like, try not to, to be mean to anyone and don't step on anyone's toes and just ignore them, but really spend most of your time. Just come to me with everything. But he doesn't. He says, yes, come to me, but, but then at the same time, go to the people around you to bring them hope and encouragement in the same way that they might bring it unto you. That there's this strength that can be found in community that's unlike anything else. That together, when people get together in community, that something incredible happens. The Bible talks about a triple-braided cord that is so much stronger than something that it stands on its own. Come on. I mean, it's so literal and it's so obvious, but it's something we so often neglect. So, as we, as we kind of end this conversation, there's so much more to be said, and there's so many things that could be included in this. I hope that gives you just even a snapshot of how to begin to walk yourself out of a cave in a way that Elijah did. And one of the things, again, I just want to say one more time, is, is the opportunity to draw near to God. Because when I do that, I think it unlocks so many other things in our life. So, I threatened you that it was coming, and I told you it was going to happen. So here we go. Why don't you do me a favor, set everything down around you, bow your head, and close your eyes. Remember, nothing spiritual about it. I just think it gives us an opportunity to slow down and hear the still, small voice of God. That maybe, today, God's not going to show up in some dramatic way but in a way that's very personal and very intimate. It's the end of the day. The outside can change all we want, but what God can do in our hearts can change everything. So let's pray together. God, thank you so much that you show up when we're hurting, that you're not disgusted or distant, that you don't think of us as less than or small in our faith, that we don't believe enough, but God, instead, you invite us to worship you. When you don't feel near Jesus, we just, we press in and we draw near to you. It says in your word that you draw near to worshipers. So even when we don't feel like you're close, we begin to worship and we're going to find you regardless because you're going to find us. So we thank you, Jesus, that you draw and you draw near and you show up. And for all of us today that have, that have been struggling with depression, maybe moments where fleeting thoughts come to mind or unfortunately, maybe thoughts that are more enduring than we'd like them to be, would you begin to silence them? Would you step in in a way that only you can and reaffirm our true identity? Would you remind us of who we really are and give us a brand new assignment, a sense of meaning and purpose that will guide and direct our lives? The biggest purpose in our life is to serve your kingdom, and we're thankful for it, that you've given us each a unique role to play. We're grateful for it. We step into it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, I'm going to make the same invitation that I did last week and invite you to this. If you are in a place right now where you feel like you're struggling with depression and mindset, I would invite you to just send us a confidential email. We're not going to share. We're not going to put it up here on the screen or do anything like that. But you can send an email to info at ballardchurch.com. If you really want to, you can send it to me personally at lance at ballardchurch.com. Shoot me an email. I'd love to help the best way that I can or even give you some resources that I think could help you in a great way. So God bless you, and we'll see you next weekend.